So welcome everybody um, and the, the people online. My name is Mike Morrow. I'm the uh, president of the St. John's uh, Center of the RESC. And I'm going to start with a uh, land acknowledgement, um, as we always do. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Big Mon Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavit and Nunatu of it and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. And as always, hopefully uh, the words aren't just words that uh, we can think a little bit about what they mean. So um, tonight I'll do some announcements and then we're going to have... Um, uh, four talks, which you uh, see listed here, Jim Stacey, Stacey David Carrick, Chris Stevenson, and Randy. Um, some observation reports, uh, which were looking a little thin until we had one nice day. Um, and then this the sky next month and some, uh, and then I'll just sort of go back over the announcement. So um, the next uh, meeting is June 19th, and the speaker is going to be Michael Power, who's probably across the hall right now working on his thesis. Um, and he's going to talk about star formation, the story so far. So um, Michael got his BSc from St. Mary's University, which is a, a big astronomy university. He did a B.Ed. and then he taught high school for a while. He's now finishing his MSc with uh, Professor Nielsen. And in September, he's going to start his PhD at the uh, Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics in Toronto. So I'm uh, looking forward to his talk, and we'll we'll hear that. Uh, we'll also um, talk a little bit about plans for the summer, um, the Butterpot Star Party, and the uh, uh, Night Sky Celebration at Terra Nova. Um, this Saturday, which is the Saturday in the long weekend, um, it's International Astronomy Day, and so we're going to go up to the, and, you know, as much help as we can get would be welcome uh, to the Geo Center from 12 to 4. We'll have um, a display set up inside. Okay. What's that? Yeah, 12, 12 to 4. And um, some solar telescopes. And uh, Jim Stacy and Nikolai Demianov will be um, talking about uh, their eclipse experiences. And I, I noticed that um, I think they were being advertised on Facebook from the Geo Center, so that's good. And um, and then in the evening, um, 9 to 11, we'll, uh, if the weather's permitting, we'll do um, uh, some outside observing. Does that sound okay, Gary? Yeah. All, all sounds good? So you're going to fix the weather for us? No, that's uh, Nikolai. Uh, okay. I don't know. And, and um, next next week on mm -hmm. Thursday, right, we've got a members-only planetarium show, which Gary runs. Thank you very much, Gary, on exoplanets. So um, note the time. It's at 7.30. And um, the other thing I want to mention is that the um, eclipse slides from our wrap-up meeting last month are now posted at www.stjohnsrac.ca. And hopefully you can find your way there. You just, I think it's still in red, the Eclipse link and you go in there and there is a uh, uh, a menu tab with the uh, images on it. So with uh, no further ado, oh, a little, little further ado. Um, so, um, uh, for any visitors, I'll just mention that um, our meetings, you found your way here, so you know it's the third Wednesday of every month except July and August. Um, and the meetings are open to anyone who wants to join either online. Um, to join online, of course, you have to contact uh, Randy at info at stjohnsrac.ca and get a link. Um, but, you know, if people are interested, we also encourage them to join. And one of the benefits is access to our um, chat line, which people share their observations, discuss things, um, uh, alerts to things to look for. 
there are some uh, publications. We have low-cost equipment rentals. And so there is a way to join at the uh, National RESC site. And there's a weekly newsletter and a monthly bulletin. Um, the newsletter you have to sign up for, the bulletin's automatic if you're a member. And now with no further ado, I'll invite Jim to come up and uh, have we'll have the first. So, so Jim's going to tell us about a modification we can all do to our refractors if you have a oh, refractor, yes. right? You've got an expensive refractor and some yep. simple and, modifications for artistic astro imaging. Okay, so uh, just keep keep <laughs> your mouse on this screen and just use the wheel to scroll okay. through your slides. Okay, uh, I didn't get that. Okay. Yeah, just as long as okay. you're, you're, you're in the So, smashed lens astrophotography. So, um, I guess I can, it goes without saying that uh, this is not highly recommended. Oh, I got to stand in front. Okay. Um, it's not highly recommended to uh, smash the lens to, uh, for astrophotography. Um, but I'm particularly interested in, in the idea of diffraction. So, lights? Oh, that's not, that's not the side he's, tell me when I'm high enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so hello to everybody out there in the, in the, uh, on the internet. Okay, so this is a smashed lens. Uh, I got this picture off the internet. And the idea is just, just how bad are, is, are the images taken with this particular lens? And there was an article online, and, and this goes, what, goes back about five, 10 years now. But uh, what's interesting is, about, is that you probably would not be able to tell the difference between the photograph taken with with the you know with the intact lens and this particular lens, uh, the the actual um, degradation is a lot less than you might think. Um, photons don't need a whole lot of area to uh, uh, to 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 basically converge on a pixel, and there's more than enough uh, aperture here to uh, to image with this particular lens. Now. You can basically see that uh, um, in this particular case that there was some loss of contrast, and I and I I could have got the got pictures from this, but it's, it's not a talk about this lens. It's a talk about a different lens. It's the, one of my prized lenses, which is a 500 millimeter uh, antique legacy Canon uh, uh, lens, which I use for astrophotography. Now. Some of the properties of diffraction you want you may, may want to actually take advantage of. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so here's an example of diffraction that we're all familiar with. And in fact, it's it's uh, on on the left here is the is the Hubble Space Telescope. And I just got this off the off the web, and you can see it's got a characteristic diffraction pattern um, for the stars. So it's got a cross, and that's basically due to the fact that the um, it's a it's a large reflecting telescope, and it's got um, um, a secondary mirror that's basically held with these uh, across the veins, basically, and that that causes these uh, diffraction spikes. And we we, we tend to associate um, stellar images now because of because of this flaw in the optics of this particular telescope. We we tend to think of these diffraction spikes as being somehow um, a property of the stars that are out there. And in a sense, they are a, pro a property of the stars out there. And it was, it was only this realization that, that, the, the, that every photon that comes from a distant star like, th like this one here or this one here is, is being imaged at the, at, at, for the very first time in our telescopes. And it's basically each photon actually um, this diffraction pattern is a quantum mechanical effect. It's like the, the double split, the slit experiments in physics, where where an electron goes through two slits at the same time. It's it's fundamentally quantum mechanical. And when I looked at that, and I had this epiphany about just how remarkable that is that this photon, every photon from a distant star, um, is is interacting with my my lens or my 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 imaging device in, in a certain way. And in this particular case, it's causing this particular type of, of diffraction pack. 
Now on the on the right, this is a deep sky, uh, one of the early first released images. This is the uh, ultra deep field uh, uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's got this characteristic six or eight sided uh, diffraction pattern. And that's because every, there were 16 mirrors in the James Webb Telescope. And, and every photon from a distant star or distant galaxy is actually impacting each one of those separate uh, mirrors at the same time, it's and 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 that pattern of sixteen mirrors is, is is sets up this diffraction or interference between the the same photon hitting all those mirrors at the same time. So I found that very fascinating. So I I, I had this idea of, of trying to well why don't I instead of smashing my prize lens try to induce cracks or whatever in such a way as to emphasize um, and basically um, create a, a random array of apertures. And, and this is what I came up with, is as I just basically strung ordinary thread um, across the uh, uh, a circular aperture, which I basically stuck on the front of my telescope. Or my 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 lens, and so each one of these apertures has got a random shape. I, I just I didn't plan any of this. I just started stringing it across, and it, and I asked myself the question: Well, I just wanted lots of big apertures and tiny apertures, and I wanted them all to be weird shapes, so that they would def, you know basically um, uh, create these weird and wonderful, hopefully diffraction patterns in some way. But every line there basically causes, would cause basically one spike. And I was thinking that with all this, I would create lots of spikes. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, I want to emphasize the brightest stars in some way. By diffusing the light from that star, I can see more of its, of its actual light and its color. I'm actually going after color by diffusing the light over a broad area on the on the image plane on on the on the image sensor I can get more color. Now I have one example of that. Oops. That's this one. And what I have here is a small gif which is just two images, one with without the mask and one with the mask. So as you can see, you can see that I get this little flashing diffraction pattern that you see on the screen there. I don't know if you can see it from there, from your side. This is only 10 minutes of, of, of data on a half an hour's worth of clear sky on Sunday night. So I was barely able to get this data. But it's, it's interesting that uh, it's the brightest stars that basically show the effect of the, of the diffractions, more, the, more so than the, the smaller stars. But it's important to realize that every star here is has got the same diffraction path. It's just that the light is being distributed in, 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 across the uh, across the uh, plane of the image. And it's only the brightest stars that have the have this diffraction pattern that you can see here. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, this particular target is the Beehive Cluster in Cancer, and um, I had 22 30 second uh, shots for both the before and after, and I processed them identically in PixInsight, Lightroom, and Photoshop. Not a, a really impressive image, but uh, just basically it shows the, the diffraction patterns. So instead of smashing your lenses, throw up some kind of a diffraction pattern if you want to do this sort of thing. Uh, personally, I prefer the uh, um, just keeping my lenses pristine. And I love my refractors without any of the veins or anything like that. So anyway, so I'm going after the deep sky photons, but every now and then, if you've got an open cluster, you got to do something to jazz up that photo because there's not much there to work. With. So anyway, thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Just real, really quick. Um, I love the diffraction image. Um, and for, 
the photographs like this, I mean, bright stars, if your optics are too perfect, all the photons would burn right into that one spot on the, on the detector, and you have no sense of how bright that star is. So diffraction bleeds it out, uh, and hopefully not bloat. So when it's nice and spiky like this and airy, uh, it's it's not probably a lot like what happens in your eye as well. Right? Well, I, I was surprised, actually, that the, I didn't get any bloating. I was going for bloat. I was trying to get bloat, but I didn't get bloat. I got the spikes. And it, it, and it, the actual stars themselves look a little bit tighter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand that. that I don't know. It's actually used for imaging the Sirius B, the white dwarf next to Sirius. Oh, okay. you, uh, you deliberately it, it get some diffraction going, and you rotate things such that Sirius B is going to be found between the spikes. And you get close to the <laughs> that's great. It seems like you can actually see more of the color of the star, too. Like, that's, yeah. that's right. That's the whole idea of this, to get the star color. Can anyone answer a question? Uh, you would, if you were, if that image uh, was of a planet, you would not get the diffraction spots. So, just wondering, um, from a physics point of view, and an answer ten words or less, <laughs> how it is, why it is that a single point of light will give that type of an effect, but uh, light from a planet, which has probably many photon streams, doesn't. Well, my, my point of view is that every photon is a quantum photon, and that means that every photon diffracts. Some, some diffraction, that is, is, it's, it's a lot less, I mean, you've got a peak, you've got a peak to your diffraction pattern that will have 90% of your light. Mm -hmm. The but diffraction, the the fractions have very small fraction of the light. Mm -hmm. So you don't see it. No, and no, it's no. also okay. smeared out a little. I can say something about that too. Um, light, so it's the same as the difference between, it's not the point thing, but it's the same as the difference between a laser and a light bulb. With a light bulb, you have lots of photons that are not correlated. Here, you from when you've got a point source it's like your photons are coming in single file so one photon interacts with the entire mess every day um every 12 at it at the same time and and so the bits of the photon that went the photon doesn't really have bits but yeah let's say that the bits of the photon that went through one part of the mask and the bits that went through the other part of the mask they started out in phase and they can interfere with each other. When you have a planet, you have photons coming from different places on the surface of the planet and they do not, they are not correlated. So they cannot in, interfere with each other. And any interference you get from individual photons just gets washed out. It must be uh, interesting to be able to show, I guess, mathematically why the stream of photons uh, don't. Uh, interact with, with one another the same way as they well, it's because they aren't, it's because the phases are random, you know, the waves are going up and down randomly. Yeah, real quick. Uh, this is possibly not as rigorous as the proper math, but I like to think of every photon as having its own kind of little potential diffraction spike, uh, or every star is having its own potential peak of dust diffraction spike, and the spike is as the thickness is as. It's as tight as the star is focused. Mm -hmm. So if you have a whole whack of tiny stars right at the top of the field, the bright star, you see that direction pattern. And if you if they're spread out into a, a disk, you see them all smudged into a disk of the crosses. They're all smudged together. It's loss of contrast, basically. Yeah. It's how you see it. So like a globular cluster, I guess, would be more. Yeah, as a, as a good example, a globular cluster would have, uh, you wouldn't be able to see the individual stars as, as well. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, Quite good good, good discussion. Good. Thank you. Um, David, you want to come on up? So our next uh, speaker is David. Um, so well, the, I didn't show Jim, but you can use this. Uh, you can get a laser pointer if you go, let's see, one click on there. One click. Not a push, it's click. Okay. And uh, just Keep your mouse over here and then just use the wheel. Oh, to go through the 
And hey, just a second. Uh, okay. okay. So I'll just like friends around okay, yeah, okay, no, no. Okay, so I'll just go forward. Oops, no way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like around. Okay, okay, so it's, it's, my talk is about um, a telescope project that I did very recently. Mike Michael Morrow actually uh, suggested that I talk about this, so I, I decided to get some pictures of it and um, show everybody what, what, I, what I did here. So basically, it's something I've done for a, a long time. I, I did repairs for the uh, bird shop, the bird and binocular shop for many years. And everything from binoculars to... Um, scopes for the um, Coast Guard and uh, telescopes that customers had. So I've, I've had years of experience doing it and also um, building my own telescopes. Uh, so I, it's, it's a labor of love as is what it is. I, I just love doing this. So it might not be for everybody to, to be uh, turning this into a uh, something usable again, but uh, I just wanted to save it. It's, it's, it's a challenge and uh, to save something from, from being put into the dump basically, which is sad. I mean, it's, there's too much of this happening, right? I think, right now uh, with all their telescopes, they sit in somebody's basement for um, years, and uh, they eventually just go go in the uh, the dump. So, so th this is something that, that I wanted to say. But it's something that it, that means a lot to me because when I was a kid, I, I lived in Toronto, and and I uh, went to the, um, the store that used to sell these. So I, I bought the. Um, lenses and and that kind of thing from this so i'm just curious does anybody know what this this is in this picture does anybody yeah. well, it's a dissected <laughs> <double stuff. laughs> yeah that's right yeah it's, it's okay it's it's called the um um what was it called the um super explorer i think that's what it's called I, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that picture in a minute but but basically this is something that um you might know somebody might know uh, is um fred learning actually um I got into contact with him from another another friend. He used to he took a physics degree here um, in the seventies. Yeah, I, I I know Randy probably knows him. But he said that you would probably know him, but but he found this telescope in the, a neighbor's basement that had been sitting for twenty years, basically sitting and rusting. And the, the person who had apparently passed away, and uh, there was a sale, so he was able to buy this anyway. Uh, so uh, and. Uh, I'll just show you some some of the besides fixing telescopes. I I, I do a lot of um, my own telescopes. I, I make telescopes, so just show you a few here. That, um, these, these are basically dialite. They're called a dialite telescope. But something that I'm really fascinated with is the uh, optical designs that have lenses at the front and the back, all the way through the, the telescope. It's, it's a different type of telescope, and, and I've basically I've uh, been working on this for many years and. Uh, they have meniscus objectives here. This is a very thin, single element meniscus lens. And then there's more elements back there. And here's a mount that I, that I made a while ago there. Okay, and I'll just show you a couple more of those. These are, uh, that's, this is something I made for my brother uh, to do imaging. Uh, he hasn't, I guess he hasn't really tried it yet, but, uh, but it's similar to the other one that, that I, uh, and here's a much larger telescope. It's the same design, but this is one of my most recent telescopes, and I'm really, really happy with this design. I'll have to bring this to, maybe I'll bring it on the um, Saturday. Uh, I may bring this one. This, this has a very thin, uh, it's almost seven-inch diameter uh, meniscus lens on the front. And just one lens, and then there's more. There's two more lenses in here, and there's some at the back there, at the very back. So, okay, and then just to I'll show you one more. Oops. And that's, this is one of the older ones that I made. But, but the main purpose of this talk is to talk about the uh, telescope that I uh, <clears throat> that I uh, renovated or, or repaired. So, so um, <clears throat> I just wanted to mention what 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 it is. So it, 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 it was made by uh, by Edmund Scientific. It's uh, a store that uh, was founded in 1942. I think it was 1942 during the the Second World War World War War, and uh, it it. Uh, was founded by uh, Norman Edmund, who was a uh, amateur photographer that that wanted lenses for to build the uh, telescopes, kind of what, I, what similar to what I'm doing. He wanted to uh, build uh, large camera lenses and the, that kind of thing. So so he contacted the military uh, 
during the Second World War and after the war, they, they just had a huge amount of surplus. They just kept sending him surplus for, for basically uh, pennies on the dollar. So he had so much surplus that he decided that he would uh, start his own company. A mail, this is a mail order company that uh, <clears throat> it, it sells. Originally, it had sold um, only surplus lenses. The, the, that's, for a number of years, he, he had got these um, lens assemblies and um, parts from the military <clears throat> to the point where he had uh, about 600 uh, was it sixty million dollars or so worth of optics that they eventually amassed over over the years, and uh, when the Korean War came along, he, he actually uh, they they were looking for optics to to buy back from him. So he was able to make enough money to uh, start the a much larger operation. So it, it eventually expanded into um, selling science projects and uh, um, telescopes. You know, which is one of the telescopes that I uh, or the telescope that I have here is is um, was from this company. Uh, from the 60s okay this is the place where i interact with it is, is the toronto uh version of edmund scientific basically it's, it's um <clears throat> a company that used to used to take or ship in the uh, components from edmund scientific and display all of their products and uh i basically uh, bought quite a few optics uh, components from from them when i was a teenager in the 70s so this, this is a 1967 catalog of, of Edmund Scientific. Uh, just, this is courtesy of the um, Internet Archive, actually, which is, which is a free uh, source of um, books and magazines and, uh, and catalogs. So I just wanted to make sure that they got they get credit for them. And this this is the uh, one of the pages of the of the 1967 uh, <clears throat> uh, or uh, catalog. So uh, basically, they, they by the time the the sixty seven came along, they were selling telescopes and parts and uh, different types of science projects, uh, chemistry sets and uh, and uh, solar. Uh, they had a lot of solar uh, power uh, electronics as well that they they were selling. And uh, I'll just go to the next page here. This is the <clears throat> that's the kit right there when I was. Uh, a teenager, I, I bought that kit right there. It's a six-inch um, grinding mirror uh, project, which I uh, worked on at the old planetarium. I was talking to Chris Stevenson about that. Uh, I was uh, <clears throat> it was something I did every weekend. I went down there and I I, I built one of these uh, or polished the mirror and, and built the uh, telescope out of pipes. Actually, I made the telescope out of uh, Pipes, and that was inside of another book that came from uh, Edmund Scientific. It was a, I don't know if you ever remember seeing these. They're little magazine style books, a bright blue color that had uh, instructions on how to build telescopes. So I still have some of those that that I uh, <clears throat> that I uh, I used to, you know, to study. Uh, there's, there's a really really good one actually that, that that explains how to figure a mirror or the how to how to polish the mirrors. I, I tried to find that. I went home to try to find that, but I, I couldn't uh, couldn't find it. And maybe next time I'll bring that in if uh, if anybody wants to see it. But if I can find it, okay. And this is the basically uh, by the time the nineteen sixties came along, they had uh, a line of telescopes. It's, I guess this is the the uh, four and a quarter inch uh, reflector telescope. It's a Newtonian telescope. It's one hundred percent made in the uh, in uh, USA. These were made in USA. And this is the one that I, I'm, I'm working on. I, I did work on it, and uh, the Happy Camper has his telescope back now. Yeah. He's uh, really happy with it. Uh, that's the Space Conqueror, which sold for, it originally started selling for around $159 back in the 60s, early 60s. 1963, actually, is the, the year it came out. And then they had this big, humongous monster telescope. I remember looking at that when I was a kid, this huge 8-inch uh, Telescope. I, I thought it was huge when, when I was a kid, but it, it, telescopes are very heavy because they're made out of uh, cast iron and steel. They're, they're very, very heavy. Okay, and just uh, and there, let's go back again to this uh, again. So, so basically, what when I got this, the the, uh, the entire telescope was seized. You, you couldn't move anything. The, the drive was rusted shut, and the uh, the polar axis w was uh, you know wouldn't even move. So I had to. Get rid of that problem first. I almost gave up on it actually because I just couldn't figure out how to do it. But but I did get some compound to uh, to release the uh, steel shaft from the uh, <clears throat> from the cast iron um, 
Well, unfortunately, I mean, those two materials are almost the same. So it, it was rusted. They're very badly rusted shut. Okay. There's the mirror right there, which is basically a write off. It was, uh, I, I brought the mirror with me to it. Uh, if you want to see what a, a 20 year old, uh, or it, a mirror that's been sitting in the, in the, um, basement for 20 uh, years looks like it was corroded um, all the way through. Basically, uh, the, the aluminum surface is, uh, been completely destroyed anyway and this is a replacement i happen to have a replacement that i i had bought years ago uh, it's a sky watcher uh, f8 uh, six inch mirror so i i, I was able to, to to fix this right away i mean i was able to oops okay and then, so what i did was i uh, once i i, I on seized it also i i recoded the uh was a very very hard uh, aluminum uh paint Something you, you you can buy at uh, Princess Auto. Actually, it's a very very high quality aluminum paint. So, so this prevent it from re rusting. And uh, this is another picture, a close up picture. So th th these were made in Barrington, New Jersey. In fact, the entire telescope is made in uh, New, New Jersey. So so it's, it's something um, unique. It's it's one, it's one of the few telescopes like this that, that I've ever ever worked on. That's uh, no, this old. It's about sixty years old, and it, it was was all made. Uh, in the USA, a lot of the parts were just, you know, hand cast. And uh, it's much like something I, I did when I was uh, in high school. I, I made some hand castings out of aluminum. But but this is all done uh, with uh, cast iron. So uh, there's just a close up here uh, showing the cast iron uh, construction. The, every piece has its, uh, its Barrington, New Jersey uh, engraved on it there. And the. <clears throat> Yeah, there's there's the finished uh, telescope right there, so it's, uh, it looks it looks a lot nicer within the original gray. It was it was really mundane looking, uh, industrial gray. I guess is the original color. And uh, finally, uh, we have oops, that's the drive right there. Actually, I, I missed that. Yeah. So so the drive itself is, is actually a very good drive. But surprisingly, this is a, a drive which uh, tracks the telescope. Actually, just so, so somebody. Uh, is new to it. Uh, it's a worm gear with a, <clears throat> a uh, worm as well. And uh, the motor is AC powered uh, 1 15th RPM. So, so it's quite accurate considering its age. I mean, it's a very old design, but because it's uh, based on AC uh, 60 Hertz, it, it actually does do a very good job with uh, much better actually than, than a lot of newer telescopes because of the uh, bronze worm gear. So it was what it was really worth, you know, trying to save it. It's a very high quality drive. For, for for that time and these are the setting circles which are the um engraved uh, circles that you use to find objects you know no hardly anybody would use these anymore this is something that that has uh was used in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s before they had go-to telescopes and now now you, you know it, you don't need to even know how to, how these work but but these were made out of um bakelite actually they're, they're very very fragile and and, uh, and hard to get if they, if they get broken Okay, I guess that's, that's the same picture there. The finished telescope. Oops, it's on there. And there's the uh, final slide right there. It's um, Fred learning uh, with, his, with his telescope all fixed up, and uh, I was really happy to get it back. So, and that's uh, that's my talk anyway. When you uh, I showed the catalog picture of the mirror grinding kit and the tins. I have a couple of those tins downstairs because Dad bought one of those kits and, and sort of I inherited. Oh, really? But, okay, yeah. It's, uh, the it's, of rouge. And, I, I, could, I could bring it back there if you want, or just just go again here. Sixty-two. Yeah, they're actually uh, there's something that I I did uh, when I was younger. I didn't have the money to buy one. I want I wanted to buy that telescope actually, the one that I fixed actually. It was a telescope I really really wanted, but I, but I just didn't have the money when I was uh, in 1972. So, so we bought this instead. It was a kit. It was actually a really good idea because because I, I got to know uh, people at the Astronomical Society in uh, in Toronto, and I, I every every weekend I went down to the to the lab in the basement. They had a focal tester, like a tester to, to uh, test the the uh, surface of the mirror to make sure that that it, you know something wasn't wrong with the way you're polishing it or, or grinding it. So anyway, but it was. Uh, I still have some of the. Uh, Cerium oxide actually that, that came with the kit. It was, it was, it was actually it was rouge, and then there was uh, you had to buy the cerium oxide. Actually, the, the original kit had red rouge, which is 
incredibly uh, time consuming to polish uh, on glass. It's very, very, very time consuming. But, but cerium, so it's, they came up with cerium oxide after anyway, which is much better, much faster. Um, how many different grits would you? Well, I guess it start, I think it started yeah, around 80 grit, I think, or so, 60 grit. And uh, you, you're basically just, you have a table, a, a, a vertical table. And you have a, a pitch slap or just a, a glass, a piece of glass. It starts with just a piece of a disc of glass. And what you do is you um, get some water, basically, and some, some uh, newspaper and just press it down. And just And basically, you just start going around the circles. Yes. It, it looks like about 10. <laughs> Is it about uh, ten different grips? Okay, yeah. So I, I'm not sure what the the, the maximum is. It right up here. Is it aluminum? I can't really tell. But a specific. I thought it was a specific pattern that's typical. Yeah, I guess I guess it is. Yeah, like um, if you don't do a specific pattern, then you end up with a turned edge or a, or a too deep. You know, or you know, it's it's, it's not 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 easy. I, I, honestly, I, at this point, like a, with where you can buy something in China. It's probably it's not probably not really worth it. <laughs> it's just uh, it, it, the problem is like you, you can be grinding it uh, and getting all the way up to uh, six hundred abrasive, and then all of a sudden you got one piece of abrasive inside that's sixty bit abrasive, and then you just go around in circles, and, and and the whole mirror gets scratched. So you have to if that happens, then you have to redo. You have to go right back down again and do the uh, the heavier abrasive. <laughs> <laughs> so what? It, like it, what, it wasn't really a practical project, but 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 I just loved it because I, I when I lived in Toronto, I, every weekend I would just go down and see meet the people at the Astronomical Society. They they had a nice planetarium show, and you know it, that, that's where the real value was. Really, not the, the mirror. Yeah, like three hundred dollar uh, telescope in nineteen seventy two. That. High end. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. Yeah, like, I just, yeah, that 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 would be it's fifteen hundred actually if you calculated that's how much it would would have cost. And so, like back then, I mean, uh, telescopes were a lot more expensive. I mean, it, in the seventies, there there were no Chinese telescopes. You know, you could just go and onto Amazon and buy for a hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah, 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 space conqueror. Yeah, that, that. I could be bothered <laughs> Yeah, what, it, 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 I remember, yeah, like, actually, I remember that telescope, yeah, it was uh, about $50 or, or something, or, or even less, I mean, it was, uh, but, but it was, but it was, it, it's really good, I mean, they're, they're made in USA, actually, the mirrors are, are USA figured and hand handmade, so, so it, it was good quality, anyway. I was, I was going to say, uh, yeah, pushing glass dead at all these amateur telescopes, and he made a 6 inch telescope, too, right? Um, but uh, I want to try it myself. I have the grid, right? So I, and I made a uh, cut a ring on a copper pipe to make the cookie cutter and drill press. You can actually cut the piece of glass itself. So I have three inches. I gave up. I, I still have it at home, actually. Somewhere in the in the basement is the glass stuck on the base with a pitch. And is that like so, so you could put a hole into it? You mean put a hole through the mirror so they can make it into a cassette grain or there? It's quite fast. You cut out two discs of glass, you glue one down, and the other one. And then you do the, the the grid thing, and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Yeah, and it's it's ridiculous, really. Like, it's, no, I wouldn't recommend it. But, yeah. but actually, the first one I made actually was from those uh, glass uh, things that went underneath furniture. You know, like they were about three oh, inches in diameter. Randy, that's been like the jagged optics were as good as the uh, Sears catalog was. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I remember the A Jaggers catalog too. I used to look at that all the time, yeah. uh, and the. Uh, and just wish that I could afford, you know, one of their lenses, you know, it was, oh, but, but, but <laughs> it was, Ed, Edmund was good for me because, because I, I, I've always been interested in designing telescope sort of lenses, like ever since I was like 10 years old, you know, so, so I basically, um, I, I bought like a parts from, from Edmunds to make telescopes, you know, and that's why it means a lot to me, but uh, anyway, I, I better let uh, Chris get on there. Yeah. Well, thank you very okay. much. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Randy, can you see this? Yeah. So that's that's on the Zoom. Okay, so uh, okay. they uh, just use the uh, little yep. wheel there, and there's a, a pointer here if you want. Just one yep. click gives you red. And stand here, just a second, stand. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can't resist. This is not what I'm talking about, obviously. 
Uh, but in parallel, because I like to distract myself with as many things at once as possible, um, take a Chinese container, uh, buy some casting resin from uh, Amazon, uh, mix it up, uh, have a old record player, 33 and a third RPM, stick it on, two days later, you have a F3 six inch mirror. This is not nearly as good as grinding your own, but uh, well, I, 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 I don't know. Um, after what, yeah, well, after what, this actually does form images, but um, that's not what I'm talking about. So now I'm trying to smash. Now, now, now I'm trying to get in on both tucks. Smashed mirror. There you go. Um, yeah, so. Uh, uh, my spiel is going to be rambling and unstructured, and I apologize in advance. Um, so I have been um, trying to do spectroscopy at home uh, for a long time. And, um, you know, decades and decades ago, I was in Toronto, and and I set the task. Here's what you're going to do your PhD on, which I never quite finished. But anyway, um, I was a chemical evolution of galaxies through nebular astrophysics, long slit spectrophotometry of extragalactic H2 regions. <sighs> yeah. um, but I did become obsessed with it and obsessed with detectors. And it's an interest that's never, never let go. So uh, when I came home, I would like to make spectrographs to go on the telescopes that I make. And and so on. So um, here's a galaxy we all know and love. This is not my photograph. This is from Chris Shore in Arizona. I was rushing when putting this together. We, our own people have some lovely photographs of M33. I could have used one of theirs, but then I had to ask for permission. So this is faster. Um, and um, uh, the idea behind my project was to take spectra of the pink clouds. These are star forming regions. Mike Power is going to be talking about these next month. And um, everywhere there's a hot star emitting lots of UV, it lights up the gas in the galaxy. And you can measure the gas and figure what the galaxy is made of. And Bob's your uncle. So kind of cool. And uh, you, your spectrographs, this kind of spectrograph, the one that I was using, takes in and measures all the light you can. So the, the detector is sensitive from this wavelength to that wavelength. You try and do it all, right? Um, and uh, so that's a fairly tall order. So that's a large amount of wavelength. So the resolution is going to be high. Uh, or the resolution is not going to be very high at all. Other people look at very tiny parts of the, uh, the, the spectrum and they look, tease out details, Doppler shifts and motions. This is a different kind of spectroscopy. It's sort of low res and a uh, big gulp, lots of wavelengths. Uh, so that's difficult to do because um, if you're using lenses, they focus different wavelengths at different lengths. That's why you have different uh, compound lenses of many, many pieces of glass to try and take the color out. Jim knows all about this. Uh, I'm not going to go into spectroscopy. Um, there's a link, uh, many links, but if you go to web, uh, webtelescope.org, spectroscopy 101, uh, in a nutshell, hot things emit rainbows, stick a uh, gas in front of it, look through it, and you see the gas's fingerprint taken out of the rainbow. If there's if the, if the energy of the light going through is enough, it excites the gas and then it relaxes by emitting and at those same fingerprint lines, those are the three kinds of, of spectroscopy. It starts with an instrument. This is a busy graph of the spectrum of that brightest pink thing right here. And this has been the sort of holy grail, okay, I want to do that at home. This was done with a four meter telescope at La Palma in 1987, but forget that. Detectors are supposed to have gotten a whole lot better since then. Let's try it. And they have. So um, we all have, or a bunch of us have planetary cameras for our telescopes. Um, this is the latest example, one of the latest examples. You stick them in the eyepiece, and they're USB 3.2, and they can blaze your images at three, 100 frames a second. And they're very sensitive. You have to be sensitive in order to have an exposure time of only a hundredth of a second or shorter, et cetera, et cetera. The detectors uh, in these 
are made by Sony and others, but mostly Sony for this class, for dash cams in cars and for security cameras at night without lights. You don't want to, you know, your, your criminals to know that they're being watched, so you leave the lights on. So they've, they've become really sensitive. The astronomers love them. The most sensitive is Starvis and then Starvis 2, which this is an example of. I won't go into the details. I love the details because I love detectors. But um, any electronic detector, every, every time you have a transistor, you've got junctions. Every junction of the diode, light emitting diodes. Every junction in ele piece of electronics glows in the infrared. That's a, that's a problem when you have a device that's designed to register light. So a lot of older detectors have what's called amp glow. And this chip has zero amp glow, um, dark, um, the way it should be. It's much, much more sensitive to infrared light for the security cameras, so you can see at night. And the trick uh, where they pulled that off, the material of the pixel, the silicon that the pixels are made out of, short wavelengths get absorbed right near the layer, the top, when they come in. The longer the wavelength, the less it interacts with the material. The long wavelength stuff, like near infrared, just sails right through. You just make the pixel deep enough that you get a chance to catch the near infrared stuff as well. It's technically difficult to make deep structures that still work, but they uh, they do it. And the last trick, Starvis versus, two versus Starvis. I don't expect you to see this, but maybe you can tell this is an older Starvis pixel and all the charges being detected in the two dimensional plane and they modified the, like, the way it works. And now charge accumulates along the whole inside of the walls. So the same size pixel, way more charge. If you can uh, accumulate more charge um, in a given exposure, you have a higher dynamic range and you can actually do better measurements. Here's how sensitive this camera is to light. Visible light, is, this is violet, this is red, this is near infrared. During my thesis, this is all the stuff that we were interested in, where all the current detectors were lousy at. So seeing this kind of sensitivity out here was really, really great. I wanted one of these, so I bought one to add to my collection of cameras. Just the detector, just the chip. Oh, oh, uh, well, I bought this camera. Um, that's yeah, about 500 Canadian. Is that something like just released or was that? A... That's been out for a number of months since last fall, basically. And they're in all the astronomy magazines and uh, six uh, QHY CCD sells it. So QHY 5.3, that's the third line of planetary cameras, six, seven, eight. And there's a monochrome and a color. And for spectroscopy, you always use monochrome because the color sensors, the pixels, some have green filters, some have blue filters. You don't want to have any filters because that's losing light. Let's see, monochrome. Well, eight yeah, 8.2 or 8.3, I think. Four it's a 1090 by, or so 1920 by 1080, but double. Just twice and twice. So uh, yeah, I've tried this with smaller, with with the, the 1090 and 1920 by 1080 cameras but they're really too small. So this was, the other thing is, oh, wow, it's twice as big. Actually, this actually works with some optics I know that are out there. A spectrograph is more than a camera, or more than a detector. So you need um, a, an entrance slit, something to select. You're gonna disperse that the light into a direction. So the simplest kind of spectrograph anyway. And uh, so you have a slit to restrict the light to only a line. I suppose you could have a squiggly line and then do the spectrum for each part of the squiggle. But anyway, straight lines, typical. You have a collimating mirror to catch that light and collimate it, make it parallel, because the dispersion, the dispersion element, like a prism or grating, wants to see every ray of light the same, all coming in at the same angle. And then the light comes off, every color in its own direction, captured by a camera, mirror, usually mirrors, because there's no color when a mirror focuses light, onto a detector. Only problem with all of this is it's all expensive. Off-axis mirrors are not cheap, et cetera, et cetera. Also, the other problem for me is the entrance slits at the back of a telescope 
I look where the array is. It's right back where the telescope is. I could put a folding mirror in, but I don't want more optics to lose more efficiency. So I decided, well, you know what? Let's try it. It's cheap. Or uh, let's just make a digital version of an old-fashioned spectroscope, which is based on lenses. I will use a transmission grating, a modern transmission grating, uh, instead of a prism. Um, and the people who work, work with gratings discuss something called blazing. And if you look at the grooves really carefully, they're shaped to, to take all the light and stick it into one diffraction order. So there's a segue to the first talk. It's all about diffraction. Um, and uh, there are many diffraction orders. Uh, uh, so if you look at the dim st uh, star spikes, you'll see that the, they're actually rainbows. And if you look for the really bright ones, you'll see a rainbow yeah. along the spike, and then you'll see another rainbow. It's twice as long along the spike and so on. Different orders of diffraction. So the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> is the 300 groove per millimeter grading that I bought, uh, of course. But look at the efficiency, absolute efficiency out here. Thousand nanometers, think. You're trying to blind me. <laughs> um, so this is great. Um, horrible in the blue, but that's okay because this detector is amazing in the blue. It it uh, it compensates. So there's my grading, there's my detector. What am I gonna use for lenses? A camera lens and a collimator lens. Okay, a couple of things. The, the pixels in this detector are only two microns big. The, the narrowest I can possibly make a slit is about 50 microns. The thickness of a human hair is 75 microns or so. Um, and so I couldn't possibly make it narrower than that. So 50, so, I, and uh, if I use the same focal length for ca camera and collimator, the image of the slit, at, all, at each wavelength, it's also going to be 50 microns on two micron pixels. That's horrible sampling. I'd like to make the slip image a little smaller, so I'll demagnify it a bit. So if I have a collimator, and this is commonly done with astronomical spectrographs, so if I have a collimator, say, 75 millimeters, and the camera 35 millimeters, um, I get roughly a two times demagnification, so I can make my slit image 25 microns. And um, I'm doing better. I can bend the camera into four by four pixels better still. So that's that's how I went. These things are mass market lenses for close caption TV cameras. Um, they're not cheap, expensive. They're roughly seventy-five and thirty-five dollars, as it turns out, for these two lenses. And uh, just putting the lens on a camera because they're adapters, you can thread it right onto those planetary cameras. And looking at the image quality, this is not bad, actually. It's actually very good. So let's try it. So I was going to make the spectrograph out of wood. The spectrograph is in a bag sitting on a chair where I was, I actually brought it with me. What? Yeah. So this is the finished product. It looks like something you throw in the fireplace, something that from you know your your renovation, bedroom renovation. This is a junk from some part of the wall or something. Um afterwards I'll take a cover off and maybe show people. But so I, I decided to make it out of wood. It's quick, it's easy. Not like David David's amazing machinery. I'm yes. Starting to think of some of the pilot they have now. Oh, Ta -da. There you go. So this has two cameras. This is the camera that takes a spectra. This is the camera that I have for looking at an angled mirror slip because I want to see where I'm pointing the telescope, right? I want to be able to aim the thing. So go through a few numbers. I won't dwell on this at all. There's something called the grading equation. And you can, the, the spectrum, the light comes in this way and mine, it's easy, comes in this way, the incident angle is zero. And the angle that, uh, where it comes out at is uh, given by this equation. You rearrange it for um, the middle of my spectrum. I'm going from 350 to 1050 nanometers. 
again, 400 to 700 is, is visible. In my case, 700 is right in the middle. Um, 700, which is right in the middle, deviates by 12 degrees. So that's the bend I need to put in from the, the entry to, to the exit. And uh, as a check, well, when I was selecting the focal length of the lenses, 350 to 1050, um, that spread of wavelengths produces coincidentally about a 12 degree spread in angle and a 35 millimeter lens will stick that, will we'll, uh, focus that across 7.7 .7 millimeters, which is the physical length of that detector. So everything is well matched. Great, um, looking good. So I could reuse a nose piece from a previous project, this metal part here. Um, I could reuse an assembly for looking at mirrored slits, this uh, one and a quarter inch focuser scavenged from something, I think it's from an old diagonal. And uh, another CCTV lens, a third one, bought a long time ago, 25 millimeters f1.4. Oh yeah, sorry, these lenses are all fast. Um, the 35 millimeters f1.7, which is pretty spiffy, and the uh, the longer one is f2.8. Fast is good because it's, this is astronomy, folks, and you want as fast as possible, you want as bright as possible. Or what, you need more than one lens? Is there more than one lens? Yeah, so this is the exploded view. There's an assembled view further down. The light comes in this way, um, uh, goes to the collimator, is parallel, goes to the grating, which is in here. And then this camera lens picks it up and focuses into the detector that's in there. The slit, which is not here, uh, takes everything else and sends it up this way, and this camera looks through the hole to see the slit. That's it. So, uh, I'm not going to read the text. Um, the uh, figuring out what I'm going to do with the slit, I figured, you know what, if I take my two glass uh, slit jaws and hold it down to a piece of steel with magnets, that means they're infinitely adjustable. Excellent. Let's try that. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, so there's the beginnings of that. I've done this a few times now, making these bloody slits. Uh, the, if you buy a first surface mirror and you sit down about the, the, the mirror grinding, this is not quite as bad because it's only two dimensional, but you're sitting down with fine grit sandpaper, successive grades of grit actually. You start at uh, 80 and 120 and 400 and you end up at 1500. Um, and you're holding this where you, you glue it onto something so it's easier to hold. And you just grind a bevel because the slit is like this and you want, if you do this and the light's coming in this way, guess what happens? It doesn't get through. You have to take off a corner to get the light into the instrument. So that takes some time. I didn't realize until the end that the back end of that piece of glass I was reusing, I had another slit in it, another bevel from a previous attempt. It was a crappy one. Uh, so anyway, the grating, the little square grating, turns out to fit nicely in the front of the collimator, right on the glass. You should never do this. Smash lenses. But I put some foam in the edges and the plastic lens cap could go over it and hold it down. I figured, let's try that. It seems to work. Final assembly, there's the slit thing. Uh, magnets holding it down. In retrospect, a single rectangular magnets would be better because the magnets were all fine. Very amusing, especially on top of a first surface mirror. There's what the thing looks like when you take the cover off. I basically explain how it works. Um, some basics about how to focus spectrographs, at least for this one, um, the way this goes together, focus the camera first before you assemble it and mark where the focus is. So you know that at, at least one piece is gonna be at infinity and then you can focus the other piece such that everything's sharp and thus the other piece is, at, is focused for infinity as well. Testing. You don't want to know when this photograph was taken. Hint, not quite 18 hours ago. Um, 
So neon glow lamp, that's in the bag too, but I'm not going to plug it in. I'm going to electrocute myself. Tired. Um, orange light, but it's neon. So it's a thin gas, electrified, and emits in that thing. And a piece of paper to diffuse it. Here's what the slit cam sees. Hello. Looking that red camera looking down. This this guy sees the slit. And you can see how crunched up one side is. Uh, one edge is smooth, the one I just made, the other edge is rough, the one that the back side of that. And here's a first spectrum. I haven't had a chance to even look at this properly yet. I think we're more or less on track. Uh, track. It's it's uh, something that's not at the right angle. Here's a reference picture of what Mercury uh, neon is supposed to look like. With color, this is a monochrome camera, so you have no color cues to figure out if it's backwards or something. Anyway, guarded success, a good start. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can redo the slit in a different way. And uh, I have another little mini project completed at home, a uh, Acme Gaseous Nebulae sim uh, Simulator. It's nothing more than a 15,000 volt uh, spark generator from China. Everything's from China, be warned. Um, and a couple of sealed glass uh, element tubes. You can buy our, all the um, noble gases in little test tubes sealed up um, and you just take the hydrogen and helium and put them near, near the spark and both tubes glow. And nebulae are mostly hydrogen and helium. So there is an artificial way of making the spectra for, for a, a, a nebula. I'll try and try with that and compare it with my holy grail white and black image from Angelis Diaz. Anyway, that's it. Rambling and up way too late doing things that are potentially dangerous, but fun. Any questions? Does the magnetic field interact with all photons coming in? Um, yes, in certain regimes, but not here, not at all. Um, so yeah, it's it just holds the holds the the, line, the mirrors down. Yep. Helium uh, tubes are are big these days. Uh, I noticed that people are now using uh, uh, diodes, colored diodes to to. Sector, uh, oh, yeah, I don't even know anything about that. Have you looked into that? Diode light sources, not really. Um, of course, you can't. I, I was going to say there are little these little orange neon indicator lamps in all appliances in the home. That was once the case, you know, your coffee maker had the little orange switch, your whatever, but and now it's all blue LEDs of all the color blue. You know, come on, when you're asleep at night, you don't want blue, red, maybe. I like the red ones. But I didn't realize the line spectrum for any LED was fine, was crisp it's enough. That you, I guess you can figure out what the peak was. It but. Depends on what your ultimate Yeah, uh, back uh, there. There is one criterion back here. There's there's one astrophysics thing here, and um, in this spectrum, like if you're in the business of looking at at nebulae and you want to learn something about them, you need to figure out what the temperature of the plasma is before you can do any success of astrophysics. And there's a pair of lines, which all the astrophotographers know about, salt per two, they call it. And it's, salt, it's a salt per two doublets, this, this pair right here. And there are two lines that are really close together. You need to separate them because the ratio of those two lines pretty directly took, gives you the temperature of the plasma. So that's the goal. You need to separate these. This, if you do the math, just barely separates them. So that sulfur two and hydrogen alpha side by side is that? Yep, that's the reason why the Hubble palette exists. That looks red. That looks exactly the same red to the human eye. So let's make hydrogen green instead, and that's the that's the Hubble palette. Any more? Oh, good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, some of you were not on the talk list, so you. Uh... Don't know about what we went through for the smug. So uh, we thought maybe we could. Uh, there you go. Jeez, that that circuit must be off. Yeah. Okay. So people uh, were 
wanting something to commemorate the uh, spectacular eclipse. So uh, I uh, started uh, asking around if anybody was interested in helping out uh, design something. Uh, Nikolai suggested perhaps a T-shirt, but the uh, REC already had a T-shirt. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it's a typical uh, concert tour one with a list of names on the back and a map and a stylized eclipse on the front, right? So, uh, whoops. So I, I wrote to the uh, talk list, asked if anybody was interested. Uh, uh, you may know that we had initially uh, worked on uh, a mug for mostly a speaker's gift, which was uh, what we call the Comet Watch. So we had some experience with making a mug. It's, it's always tough if you don't know what the process is, you know, the various sizes and this sorts of things. So I I thought, well, uh, maybe I'll just reverse the uh, the Comet Watch picture and stick a, a solar uh, <laughs> eclipse up with a quarter, and uh, there we go, right? <laughs> well, uh, people didn't like that. So... So uh, two people uh, agreed to help out with the process. So I, I showed the design palette that I had, what we were working with, you know, 3.8 inch by seven and a half inch. And I showed the uh, Comet Watch picture as a, a sample of what we were looking for scale. And then I just showed some of the stuff we had available, the crest, some text, a couple of photos that I scarfed off the talk list. And the uh, the map you've all seen the map from the uh, from the brochure, right? So I figured uh, since everybody's seen that, maybe we could use that somehow, right? Um, so discussion went on then, and uh, various designs we were looking at. Uh, so. Uh, I came up with a quick one based on on that map. Uh, basically, just the uh, the crest, the the map, and I put some. I look what looked like spiders, <laughs> supposed to mark the the sites where we were, as a center, not where everybody was, and uh, just some stylized uh, elements there. Well, that elicited some response. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Jim agreed to help out, provide the picture, gave some design elements, and uh, we went on. So then I had a couple of choices there. I greedily used my own picture for the middle one. And again, I didn't know what else to put in the center. So again, these are just design suggestions, right? And that elicited some more response, as you can imagine. And uh, the push then was for something simple, a nice image and some text and the crest. We always need the crest there, right? And uh, so then we, we started a huge debate about fonts and font size and font color and font position and et cetera, et cetera. So eventually we did come across uh, uh, some coloring. We didn't want to take away from the beautiful image there. And then I, I shrunk down the, uh, the crest. Uh, suggestion then was, well, why have a, a separate font from the crest font? So I actually had to look up the copyright <laughs> for the font to find out what font for the crest, see what font they actually used. And that took some historical checking and all this sort of stuff in the REC backgrounds. It's Garamond if you're interested. And uh, so then again, we just wanted to decide, that's basically what we came up with. Uh, a, a beautiful image has most of the elements that everybody looks for. Uh, if you turn the mug the right way, you could see the moon, uh, has some prominences there. The uh, crest is not a 
too intrusive. Um, I had to learn, relearn how to get transparent crest. As you notice, all the previous ones had a square block for the, the crest because that's what they provided with us. So, uh, and then I, I just looked around at perhaps another simple design. Uh, Jordan had a fantastic uh, prominence picture. So I mocked up one of those as well. But in the end, uh, people uh, basically voted on the center one, the, uh, the simple design. And then uh, we, we debated colors and quite rightly, um, we didn't want to take away from the elegance of the picture. Some people suggested a dark blue or black would be the best thing to highlight the picture. So these these are the previous mugs that we've had in blue and black, and I have red and white as well. But in the end, we came up with that one. And uh, I think you've all seen that mug, right? Beautiful mug. Um, I did uh, make a couple of samples of some other things. My picture, my map, where I was. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Gary got one of those. <laughs> And I even uh, tested one in a, uh, these are called um, thermos ones, is a thicker. Uh, unfortunately, those would run about $45, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's what we have. It's a beautiful uh, design, very elegant, I think. Uh, you've all seen it, haven't you? This is, I call it a sample because it was a flawed mug. It had a piece missing, so I put the word sample over it so you wouldn't see. Um, I initially ordered five just to make sure that the size was correct and the color and all these sorts of things. And they, they were great. So uh, we, we've got 40 um, spoken for and sold, another 10 coming, and we'll continue to order them as long as we need them. There's still some people who haven't. Um, we, we, as an executive agreed to, uh, offer free shipping to anyone out of town for one mug. Uh, <laughs> I foolishly thought that, uh, well, maybe I could ship them for twice the cost of a calendar. Ha! <laughs> 25 bucks. To ship them, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a common price no matter where you go in the province. Uh, a little bit more when you go offshore. So, uh. Uh, there's a very uh, lucrative market right now on uh, memorabilia. Uh, the Geo Center produced a, a button saying, uh, I witnessed the total solar eclipse in Gander, which is a lie. So I found another place that was doing, I, I wanted one. Oh, a Christmas uh, ornament that had some mountains and trees in it. That's what we had out in Codroy. So this one is actually a Codroy, Codroy Beach, Newfoundland uh, memento. I also ma had made uh, a couple of uh, clips, uh, Christmas ornaments. They have uh, that picture on one side, which is my picture. And uh, on the other side, it says Codroy, Newfoundland. So uh, that's a very lucrative market right now in uh, memorabilia. So, uh, yeah, and, and these are the two plates here. So uh, thanks to uh, Nikolai, Gary, Mike, Jim, Chris, if I've forgotten anybody who uh, offered comments and design elements or uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, get them while they're hot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Randy, did you did you just walk off with my light? No. No. Thank you. No. Okay. And we were clapping, but I, I think we 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 need to thank Randy for doing all that work on the mugs. There. Gonna be great mementos. <laughs> okay, so um
we'll go on with some uh, member observations. Uh, we didn't have many clear days in the last month, but when we did, there was a, a lot of activity. So um, people were still... Uh, People were still fired up with uh, some of their solar stuff, so we did get some images. And there was some interesting stuff happening, as you all know from the, the news in the sun. Um, so this is back uh, in April. Uh, and this is Gary with the Sea Star. And uh, what we thought at the time were some big sunspots and... Uh, a bird-shaped sunspot there. That's very impressive. <laughs> and and uh, pretty, pretty impressive. And uh, Randy, let's see, that's the same day, Randy, using a, a different filter, but also with the sea star. So there's uh, the same sunspot groups. Chris did an image with, uh, that's the Club Solar Telescope, and I guess that's your fancy camera there. That's the blue camera. Yep. Yeah. And uh, there's the, that's the same day, so there's the sunspots and uh, a little parade of prominences there. And I tried it uh, a couple days later, so um, the sunspots have moved a little bit. Um, and there's still some nice prominences. And then Randy, May 6th. So what's that? That's a little over, uh, uh, that's 10 days ago, nine days ago. Um, so uh, some big, bigger sunspot groups coming in. Um, uh, 3664s uh, there in the center. And then, yeah, so that's, let's see, those are more images. So that, so what he's doing is he's, he's sort of uh, zooming in on some of the different sunspot groups. And so this is May 9th. So that's, uh, what's today? 15, yeah, so so last week. Um, so there is 3664. So, uh, so there's, I guess, 3664. And there it is again. And, and that's the one that's responsible for um, the, the uh, uh, aurora that we've been seeing in that, I believe. And uh, so on May 12th, I had a shot at the moon. Um, and uh, Gary had a shot, had a look at the same thing, and but uh, getting in a lot closer and pointed out this uh, valley. So Gary, what's the story about that? Well, uh, the valley, uh, they think it was made by a... a Meteor coming in, breaking up, and piece piece afterwards knocked down one side of it and knocked down its underpiece and created the thing. Some think it's uh, uh, caused by the uh, uh, basin and the uh, yeah, projectile from the basin that caused it. Okay. And the two craters on either side came after because they're fully formed and nothing. Okay. okay. And so the the crater is is that the one that's yeah. labeled there? Okay, yeah. very the nice. One right at the bottom is the thing. But if you notice closely, it goes from one side to the other, so they think now it might be two valleys. Oh, okay. Instead of one. Hmm. Yep, very interesting. It's so always interesting to hear Gary talk about the moon. And uh, Randy got a shot of. There, there is a uh, comet now, which is pretty nicely placed. It, it's in Virgo, so it's in the south and, you know, pretty high uh, after sunset. So very, yeah. Oh, down there, yeah. 
that the comet that's get, is going to get really bright? Yeah, right? Yes, and I think so. Really, so. You can already see a tail on it. Already. Um, you can't. It's certainly not naked eye yet. It's it's what about uh, nine or something like that. Um, but the Sea Star does a really nice job uh, with comets. I'm impressed. And so I had to try it. That uh, my pictures flipped around um, a couple nights ago. Um, yeah, so Sunday night, I guess. And uh, so I. People who are familiar with deep sky uh, uh, stacker. There's two ways you can, of course, the comet is moving differently from the way the stars are. Um, it's moving in addition to, uh, it's got movement in addition to the Earth's rotation. So if you just do sort of normal stacking, the, the comet gets smeared out and uh, if you do the right things, then you can get deep sky stacker to keep the comet in one place. So it sharpens up and then all the stars get smeared out a little bit. So this was um, about a 20 minute uh, acquisition. So that's how much the stars were moving. Well, that's really how much the comet is moving with respect to the stars. In, uh, what's that? So yeah, so in the fall, that's maybe going to, well, it should be, well, we're hoping it'll be uh, naked eye. So comets are fun. And that, so then that night, so while I was wasting my time doing this, <laughs> the pedals were out at uh, um, Outer Cove. And so Cynthia and I got out there afterwards. But when you looked at the... Uh, Aurora predictions that actually showed that earlier in the evening was going to be better. So, um, and ran into John while, while we were out there, but after it was starting. Not, not naked eye, no. You couldn't see it like that. No. So, this, this, you, you had to use a camera to see that, but uh, um, there was definitely something there. You, you can definitely see that that's Aurora, not just. Low, so that's that's pretty cool. And uh, so then for deep sky objects, and again I sort of go from uh, uh, twenty three hours right ascension, sort of down to low. And so uh, Jim Johnson did a, a dark nebula here near uh, Cepheus, so basically a, a cloud of dust. So to locate there, there's Polaris, Cassiopeia, so Cepheus is uh, in between, and lovely shot of the uh, dust clouds there, and uh, that's using his, so, so we have to, uh, when, we're, when we're looking at Jim's pictures, we have to, uh, he's got several telescopes on the go, so this is his uh, small refractor. And uh, Randy did the cat's eye nebula with um, the sea star. And so here is, to, to orient you, here's Hercules um, and Vega. And there's Draco. So this cat's eye nebula is in here. And in the image, you have to, I can see it. Let me move that out of the way. Um, I don't trust that. No, but I think it's that little blue smudge in between those two stars, right? That's the nebula. You think that's the nebula? Okay. Because there, there is. Okay, my mistake. Then. So eight minutes. Yeah. Okay, and we're starting to get into globular cluster season. So we've got some images of M92 and the great cluster in Hercules, M13. So there's Hercules, Arcturus. Um, we're going to hear about Corona Borealis in a few minutes and Vega. So I always find that by starting at Vega and 
going between Vega and Arcturus, and that's where yeah. this is going on. Just so um, these globular clusters, um, M13 is 22, about 22,000 light years away. Um, they're, they're old stars, um, you know, over, over 10 billion years old. Um, so they, uh, there are a few uh, new stars, but they've been formed by collisions, um, sort of reigniting star formation. They're called blue stragglers. And so here is M13, lovely picture from uh, Rim Johnson using the eight inch Raza. And um, uh, 85 minutes there. And Randy did M13 and a satellite, I guess. That's seven minutes. And John's a new member of the Sea Star Club, so he's got an M13. Very nice. And um, there's two images here because there's a galaxy or something over here. Did we figure out what that was or did you? <laughs> okay. Yeah, a little galaxy, a little galaxy, a little galaxy there. And M92, so M92, Hercules is not quite square, and M92 is out one end of it. So another globular cluster nearby. This is again with the uh, Raza, which we're going to hear from Jim's. I don't know if Jim's online. I didn't. Oh, he is online. Hi, Jim. Uh, so, uh, hi. Another another nice uh, shot there with the Raza, and uh, I think we've got something else coming up that you can say something about. Uh, and Randy did M ninety two as well, and John. So the uh, it's really globular cluster season. We're going to see lots more. Um, but before we get there, um, also in this uh, area right down here is a cluster of galaxies, which uh, Chris got a picture of. Um, so what's that? Oh, this is Jim. Oh, a different one. Yeah. So, the, so Jim, um, get ready, Jim. So this is Jim's cluster. Sorry. Yeah, yours is also an A-bell, but a different A-bell. Um, uh, the Hercules Galaxy Cluster, lots of galaxies, uh, about 500 million light years away, um, some interacting galaxies, and galaxies tend to be in clusters, and then the clusters tend to be in superclusters, and there's a lot of interesting cosmology goes into that. But the brightest member of this cluster is NGC 6041, and so here is... Um, this image. So, Jim, do you want to say a little bit about this? Have you counted? Oh, well, the uh, show the annotated image. Yeah. So the here's the annotated image. So I I understand that Jim, you went through and actually put every one of these notations on, right? Absolutely. I just finished like just before the meeting. Okay. Right. So, um, no, I did not. The the brightest one is right here, so I'll go back now, so you can see every one of these. Every one of these is a galaxy, right? Is that right, Jim? That's correct. Yeah. So there's a lot of galaxies in that picture, and so now now that you've seen that, the red ones are sort of the the parts of this cluster. So, um, so do you want to say a little bit more about that one, Jim? I, I guess the only thing I could say is I wish I had more focal length. But then it wouldn't be as fast, would it? Oh, God, no. You'd only be shooting like F7. Yeah. Anyways, amazing, amazing shot there. Thanks. And uh, so we've heard from Chris on the um, and other people on the uh, uh, chat group about... Um, and we talked about it last month that uh, sometime in the next few months, we expect uh, this star, T. Corona Borealis, to 
um, flare up its its uh, recurrent nova uh, as it um, uh, accretes material from it's in a uh, um, a pair it's in a it's a binary star so there's a red red giant I guess with it yeah and it's a white dwarf and um, when it gets enough material it'll it'll flare up so I've oh I've got that written down here the last outburst was 1946 and it's about every uh, 80 years. This is something that doesn't just become noticeably brighter in the telescope. This will be as bright as the brightest star in Corona Borealis. When it's, it's an easy night drive. Yep. And so um, several people have taken pre... Um, so I think that's it right there, right? Robert and... Uh, and Jim, uh, again, I think you're centered right on T. Corona Borealis there. Yep. And, yes. And so these are all the sort of pre-shots for the C star. You have to look at the uh, galaxy. They The C star can't get you right to um, it, but it can get you close. So is it this one here then? Yeah. And... Um, yep. Yeah. But yeah, so I I think for for my go to, I would have to use that um, that object as well to get close to it. Um, and so this, so stay tuned. We'll presumably have some. It'll be bright for about a week, and, and the the weather is never bad here for a whole week at a time, right? <laughs> It could have already happened, but well, I guess we would have heard about it. Somebody else would have seen it. So um, Chris also had a um, uh, a shot of a galaxy cluster, and these are galaxies that are a billion light years away, so it, it's kind of mind mind-boggling. Um, oh, there it is. There we are. So all the little smudgy bits there are galaxies. You want to say a bit more about that, uh, yeah. Chris? Of course, earlier in the evening, I was photographing um, the globular. And, uh, just for laughs, I put Arcturus in the frame and you know, make big exploding the star. I wasted a well, wasted evening on that. And when I finally got down to shaking images of this, the sky started closing in almost immediately. So there were 47 frames, only about a dozen of which are usable. And to top it all off, I forgot to refocus the telescope. <laughs> so, uh, but all 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 the uh, reddish smudges are the galaxies in in uh, this uh, super cluster of galaxies. And um, yeah, I'd like to do this field again and sharp, the sharp one maybe half a smidge, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty cool to, to be capturing photons that are. That predate life on this planet is it's a pink in the past. So yeah, when when you do outreach things, people often come and say, How far can your telescope see? Yeah. Okay. And well before you were born. That <laughs> that's about as far as I think one of ours can see. So that's pretty good. Okay, so um some other popular targets. Um M101, the pinwheel galaxy in the world. Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, um, both spiral galaxies near the Big Dipper. Um, and so John um, now has a sea star as well. There he is. A um, couple shots there, and I um, just used PowerPoint to brighten that one up a little bit. And... Um, so this one is a longer acquisition, I guess. Yeah. And uh, very nice. And Randy did M101. And that's just 15 minutes. But that's pretty impressive for 15 minutes. And Gary, also with the C-Star. Uh, M101. <laughs> and then John did uh, M51. So this is... Um, M51 interacting with uh, with NGC 5195 
Um, apparently, this was the first galaxy that was identified as a spiral when, when I looked things up. So that's interesting. Okay, a long time ago. And uh, so back to globular clusters. There were several people taking pictures of M3. So just to orient you, um, there's Ursa Major, there's Arcturus, Arc to Arcturus, and M3 is on the way, a little bit underneath the Arc to Arcturus. And um, one of the interesting things about M3 is that it's um, it, it's still pretty old, but it's um, still got what astronomers, what astrophysicists or astronomers, I guess, would, would call metals. That just means elements that are, and it's just a little bit of elements, but it's elements that are heavier than um, hydrogen and helium. That's what metals are. Um, so that's that means that uh, the stars in that globular cluster, there have been a few generations um, in order to produce those heavier elements. Um, so uh, M3 is very photogenic. So I took a shot of it on May 5th. Um, Chris did a nice shot and uh, reprocessed this and sent it in today. Um, and John took a shot with the sea star. And Robert did a shot of M3. So, and one more um, M53. So here's Arcturus and Leo. So to orient yourself, uh, Coma Berenices is in between, but pretty hard to see. I know those are not big stars. Um, but Leo and Arcturus are pretty easy to find. And M53 uh, is a nice globular cluster in here, um, just down from M3. And there's another um, cluster here, which is a low-density globular cluster, MGC 5053, which shows up in some of the pictures. So there's one here from Jim. Um, so here's M53, and there's MGC 5053. Uh, and that's uh, 155 minutes with the uh, RASA telescope. Uh, very nice, Jim. Mm -hmm. And I had a shot at that one as well. So there's M53, and I framed it a little bit differently. And there's MGC 5053. And the Leo triplet is still around. So there's a lot of the sky. So there's the Big Dipper, there's Leo, there's Arcturus. Um, so pretty easy to find Leo. Um, and the Leo triplet is down here. There are some other galaxies up here, which we had in previous meetings. And uh, Robert did did this one and then um, had a big, uh, had some vignetting, but got, but dealt with it. Uh, so this was, uh, Robert reposted this uh, a few days ago. And Jim Johnson also had a shot at uh, processing it. And so these are actually the same image processed by Robert and uh, Jim. So do you want to say anything about that one, Robert? Or? Um, um, darn Jim anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim, do you want to say anything about that? I never heard what he said. He said, darn Jim anyways. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Robert. <laughs> anyway, I they're both nice images. I, it's the same image, it's the same stuff there. Um, and uh, finally, I think this might be the last one in the sequence. Here's the Big Dipper, and the way I always find M81 and M82, Bose Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy, is I start at this corner of the Dipper go diagonally across and then just go the same distance out and i can usually find them with with my daub and they're they're um with the daub and sort of my low magnification i can get both of them in it's a nice image uh but randy did m81 with the sea star you can see it it's a nice spiral galaxy um oh and that's it so we 
Nobody nobody bothered with M82, although it's very nice. It's a starburst no, galaxy. Um, yeah. So that's the end of the observation report. So I'll invite uh, Robert to come up and run us through. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, welcome. My mother, I'm not making that bigger. Big enough to read. How's that? That's good. Okay, so just use the uh, use the little wheel here to uh, scroll. Okay, and there's a pointer here, just one click as you read. Okay, folks, um, I'm going through the sky this month. Uh, as we all know, here's the day night cycle um, with changes, with some changes in the time of day for when astronomical flight begins and ends. Uh, there's nothing new there. Here's the sun today, and uh, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you can see there's lots of numbers up there, so there's plenty of spotting, which means, of course, good chance for. Yep. Look at that screen. <laughs> so you can see plenty of spotting, which means uh, possibility for more aurora yet, right? So let's hope and pray that we get some clear sky and uh, and some nice big blobs of plaza, plasma blown our way. Just not enough to knock satellites out of the sun. Planet Roundup, uh, this is where the planets are okay. for this particular time of uh, the year and, and month. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Venus and Saturn are visible to us right now. The rest of them are pretty close to the sun, I think. Um, uh, the moon, uh, seven days old, 50% illuminated, good time for observation of it, uh, if we can get some clear sky to do so. So let's hope and pray. Any chance, I haven't checked the forecast today, is there any chance for here for the next couple of days? Well, Saturday may not be too bad for the moon. Right? There's a little notch. Okay. All right. A notch. We'll take a notch <laughs> if we can get one. Uh, comet Roundup. Um, I have four listed here. Is any of these the one that uh, you use? 202383. Okay. That one right there. Yeah. 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 I don't know if I would, I don't think I can pronounce that, but. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what's reported there. Um, that came out of uh, InTheSky.org, I think. Um, and possibly brightening, right? Uh, more towards the fall, we may get a show. So fingers crossed. The Northern Hemisphere to make it whole time, or is it? Now, I'm not sure uh, of the. Uh, I was going to say trajectory, but that's not right. Uh, the imp, I can't even pronounce it, inferosis, is it? Uh, ephemeris. Ephemeris, that's it, uh, for that. But, and I won't deviate right now because <laughs> we're getting a little bit later, but you can certainly uh, find this document online and just uh, click the sky.org uh, planet source or um, comet chasing skyhound and uh, There'd be a lot, a lot of information about those. Yeah, to find out. Um, hopefully, it will. But sometimes they do. A lot of them do migrate into the southern hemisphere before we get a chance to really uh, get a brightening. But um, they're fickle creatures. So I, I saw went around the time about them disintegrated. It was supposed to be really bright. Yeah, that was about two or three years ago. And yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, I think I remember the one you're talking about. Yeah. They showed a picture of it on the map that I wanted to show it. It's been a great resort. Yeah, it just went into a cloud, right? Yeah. Yeah, it evaporated, basically. Yeah, 
So uh, for some observing objects that are well placed for this time of month for uh, both binocular and telescope, uh, that's listed here for us. And uh, supernova right now, um, I had a look and for anything that's not 17 and 18th magnitude for which you'd need the, you know, a Mount Palomar sized <laughs> telescope to use and see. There's four here that are possibilities, right? The GI is best for people in the southern hemisphere now. Too close to the sun. No too close to the sun now, is it? Yeah. yeah. It's, to yeah. yeah. it's too bad because that's the brightest one, right? Right now. Anyway, uh, principal meteor showers uh, listed for, uh, for us. Uh, Oh, I didn't. Uh, I don't think I. I don't think I updated this because the uh, highlight is for the Lyrids in April. So May fourth, fifth is gone. So we're looking at the Delta Aquarids and the Perseids, of course, the most famous of all of them, coming up in August. Uh, International Space Station passes for May. This is just a sampling. There probably are more. Uh, and all you need to do is go online again and just click on Heavens Above and uh, have at her. You'll be able to find out, you know, May and on into June. Um, some information about observing sessions. And of course, our next observing session, as we all know, is this uh, Saturday. So we're looking forward to that. And please God, we'll get a, a notch. And uh, I think that's that's about it for me. For Roberts, on uh, June the fourth, I think the one of June the fourth, yeah, would be a good time to get out for a photographic shot. We'll get I think five of the planets straight in a row. Oh, was that right? We'll get Saturn, Neptune, uh, uh, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Uh, I think Uranus, or I don't know what we'll do, but three four. It's early, early morning, June the 4th. Okay. Yeah. Who here was looking at Soho images, animations only and long, from or from map projections, the blue movies at Space Weather. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm. So, um, uh, yeah, that was quite a storm. That was, yeah. You could see it. Um, uh, an interesting observation uh, in, in all of them, you could see Jupiter on one side and Venus on the, on the other, up to the sun. Um, and you can see them moving. So on opposite sides of the sun, they have them both on the same side of the sun, i.e. the morning rising side. By yeah. June. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Mm. Um, but uh, in, one, in one of those loops, there's the planes. Oh, is that right? In a Soho movie club. And oh, it looks yeah. really great. Yeah. That, that's pretty cool. And yes. it also tells you that the planes is it's, uh, the stars are pretty accurate. Indeed. Mm. Okay. Uh, and any. No other comments or questions or anything about that? Okay, thank Yo, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
and then uh, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, there'll be a planetarium show on exoplanets, and the eclipse slides are posted. So um, thanks, everyone. That's it, and uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in a, well, hopefully we'll see you in a couple days at the Geocentric. Yeah.